All, we're here gathered by the Science Gallery Venice in collaboration with the Ars Electronica Festival this year to talk about the role of doubt in the delicate process of artistic creation from the Renaissance to contemporary times. Science Gallery Venice, one of the eight galleries of the Global Science Gallery Network, features unique immersive experiences to explore human relationships to nature and interconnection with one another. Our main goal is to ignite creativity and inspire new ideas and collaborations in pursuit of a better future for the next generations. Science Gallery transcends typical art galleries and traditional science museums by finding new ways of engaging young people with some of the global challenges of our time. Our programs aim to be dynamic, exciting, controversial, and to capture the imagination and inspire curiosity and action. Today's program will feature Marco Faini and Matteo Lonardi. I am Michel Rayac moderating the presentation. Doubt has played a critical role in both society and art since the time of the Renaissance when it first entered the public sphere as a distinct concept. Cafoscari, University of Venice researcher Marco Faini will explain the concept of doubt, while Matteo Lonardi will speak about the role of doubt in the artistic process from Leonardo da Vinci to contemporary artists. Their new VR project, Doubts of a Genius, Il Dubio, takes the viewer on a journey from Leonardo's studio to modern times. And a version of Leonardo's studio is available in a specially designed Mozilla Hubs space, which is linked from the web page as well as in the video description on the live stream. First, we will hear from Marco Faini about the development and representation of the concept of doubt in the Renaissance. Following that, Matteo Lonardi will present his VR project, Il Dubio, and speak about the role of doubt in artistic creation including VR. We will follow that up by live Q&A with the artist and researcher. Let me introduce you to both of them. Marco Faini is an MSc fellow at Cafoscari University of Venice for the EU Bivium project, standing at the crossroads, doubt in early modern Italy from 1500 to 1560. He holds positions at both the University of Toronto and the Cafoscari University of Venice. Matteo Lonardi is a VR director whose films toured at Kaleidoscope, the World VR Forum, Milano Film Festival, Torino Film Festival, and Sunny Side of the Dock. His most recent project came from the Venice VR College and is included in the Venice VR Expanded Session at the Venice Film Festival this year. Thank you to our participants, collaborators, and sponsors, Cafoscari, Ars Electronica, the European Commission, Reframe VR, Overlap, and Vive. Now I think we're ready to um, give the floor to Marco Fain. Thank you, Michelle, for your uh, presentation. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see my uh, PowerPoint. Hopefully you can see my presentation. Can you? Yes. yes. So uh, like Michelle says, said, my today's talk comes from my uh, Marie Curie project funded by the European Research Council. Sorry, sorry, Marco, I can't see it. So. Maybe I can share it. Yes, it's perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Can you? It's working now. Okay. So like I said, this, this talk comes from my uh, research project funded by the European Research Council. 
and uh, project about dark and Renaissance Italy. And I will start by showing you uh, a picture of the brand new uh, Toronto store of Italy. So I was living in Toronto until a few months ago. And once in Italy opened, I paid a visit to this brand uh, new beautiful place. And once I was there, I discovered that Italy as a policy articulated in a few rules, and, and as, as you can, can see from the slide, slide, the first rule says that the customer is not always right, and the second one says that Italy is not always right. But the last one is possibly the most important and most relevant to us today, because it, it says that it is this difference that creates harmony. But if, if you, you look, look at the Italian, Italian version, version, possibly the original version, version you can see that it says la nostra armonia nasce dal dubbio. Now, probably this difference between uh, doubt and differences uh, speaks books uh, about cultural differences between Anglo-Saxon culture and Italian culture. I won't go into that. I will only say that the idea that doubt fosters harmony as a story, and this story goes back at least to the Renaissance. It was in the Renaissance that scholars and intellectuals began to nurture the idea that doubt can be used to overcome differences. At the time, it was mostly religious differences. And it was Erasmus of Rotterdam, possibly the most famous uh, intellectual or um, came up with this idea of using doubt as a means to create harmony and peace. Now, one of the first questions that I asked myself was, what did doubt mean to Renaissance people? Uh, did, did it mean the same thing that me, it means to us? So I've been looking uh, into dictionaries and encyclopedias and I'm using these words in a rather loose uh, sense and I'm not gonna read these uh, Latin definitions, but if you look at them, you'll see that doubt is usually associated with the idea of crossroads, uh, of a point where two paths or more than two paths meet. So the idea of uh, being in, in a condition of doubt was compared to that of a person who stands at a crossroads, unable to make a decision about which way uh, to take. And if we look at this nice image that comes from Andrea Alzato, Books of Emblems, an emblem is an image accompanied by a text that describes this image. We can see, for example, this three ways, three paths meeting in one point. And if we look at that text, uh, I'm not gonna read the whole text, but if we look at the last couple of lines, we see that the text goes, we're all at the crossroads. And on this, um, on this track of life, we go wrong unless God himself shows us the way the idea being in this particular text that uh, we humans, we human beings are in a condition of doubt, a sort of existential condition. So doubt is not just a moment in life, it's just the state we are in as human beings. Now, one of the uh, possible objections to what I'm saying is that People have always voiced doubts before the Renaissance and after the Renaissance. So you could ask me, uh, what's new? Why are we studying the Renaissance? And uh, we know that there are beautiful stories of doubt that were uh, famous. Uh, this one, for example, the story known as the incredulity of Thomas or the doubting Thomas or the doubt of Thomas. This is a beautiful picture by painting by Caravaggio. But I suspect, and this is the point that I'm trying to make in my work, that what is new in the Renaissance is that people begin to feel the need to talk about doubt. And instead of just voicing doubts, they begin to understand and to reflect on what doubt is and how can we use it and what the purposes of doubt can be in different cultural uh, contexts. And in this, uh, cultural environment, uh, people, writers, and artists also begin to reflect on how we can visualize doubt. Uh, is there a way to picture doubt, doubt itself, not just single episodes, not just single stories of doubt, but doubt, does doubt have a shape? And probably this means or meant to these people also 
uh, the attempt or the possibility to handle doubt, which was a complicated and sometimes disquieting notion. And so uh, Renaissance artists begin to reflect on how to visualize doubt. And one of them, Cesare Ripa, came up with a nice uh, image to describe and to visualize doubt. Doubt, according to Ripa and his iconologia. The iconologia was a sort of manual meant for artists to teach them how to represent mostly abstract categories, uh, such as, for example, dubbio. So according to Ripa, I won't read the whole text, but according to Ripa, doubt is a young man walking in the darkness. And this young man is dressed with a dress of changing colors and is holding a stick and a lantern with his hands. I have a, also a, an English version of this passage for those of you who are interested. And why a young man? Because, says Ripa, young age not only is prone to asking questions and raising doubts and questioning uh, received truths, but also because young age uh, lacks the necessary knowledge and experience to understand reality. And the dress of changing colors means that doubtful is all, a doubt is always changing and evolving and changing shape. Now we can look at some images. So on the uh, right hand side of this slide, you can see the young man with his lantern and his stick that represent experience and knowledge that help me help him uh, finding his way in the darkness. On the left hand side of the of the slide, you see the same the same image uh, coming from a, an early neoclassical early nineteenth century neoclassical uh, edition of Ripa, and you can say that with his nice colorful dress, as opposed to certainty who is sitting still in this sort of monumental pose. In the middle, we can see another way of visualizing that. I'm not gonna tell you the whole story behind this image, but it shows a young man, again, holding a wolf by the ear. Um, that means that this young man is uh, unable to either let the wolf go, because the wolf will kill him, or nor can he spend the rest of, of his life carrying this wolf by the ear. So this young man really visualizes, embodies the condition of doubt as the inability to make a decision between two uh, equally powerful options. And I'm trying to focus on images because today we're talking about images and virtual reality and moving images. Um, and I have a couple more examples that I would like to uh, discuss today. One is taken from a poem by Michelangelo, Michelangelo Buonarroti, who was a poet as we all know, and who has a poem, a fragment actually, is not a, a complete poem, an allegorical poem known as Ottave dei Giganti, because in this poem, Michelangelo uh, describes some giants. Um, and this poem begins describing the life of some shepherds who live a happy life, peaceful life, according, uh, respecting the laws of God, and they don't, they're not greedy, they don't look for gold. And among them, one, says Michelangelo, does not find doubt, perhaps, and how and why, which uh, Michelangelo represents as real characters in this poem. And for all of these logical entities, log logical uh, categories, Michelangelo provides a description. And he describes doubt, uh, you have it on the slide. I, I will read only the English version. Doubt is depicted armed and crippled and moves around by jumping like the locust. So doubt is represented as a crippled man who moves around jumping because doubt once is dispelled in one place is reborn in another and doubt is depicted armed. That means that doubt is dangerous. Uh, Michelangelo describes him as an outlaw. And Michelangelo describes in the same way also why. Uh, he describes why as a burglar who walks around again in the night carrying keys you know, to force locks and to steal. That means that asking too many questions, posing too many doubts is perceived as a violation of the boundaries that God has set to human knowledge. There are certain limits that we should not, so to speak, trespass. Otherwise, we are committing a sort of an act of violence. And this is what doubt does. My uh, last example comes from a text by Daniele 
Daniele Barbaro. Daniele Barbaro was a humanist and a man of church, as you can see from uh, this uh, portrait. He belonged to uh, one of the most prominent Venetian families and uh, a family of humanists. And in 1542, when he was still rather young, he published a book called Predica dei Sogni, a sermon on dreams, in which he talks about dreams, of course. But at the end of this text, we find a series of sonnets of poems on doubt. It's called Del Dubbio. And it's a series of five sonnets in which Daniele Barbaro reflects on what doubt is and what, are its, what its consequences are and what doubt represents to us humans. And on the one hand, Barbaro praises doubt because he says doubt uh, rejuvenates culture. Doubt is a powerful, so uh, uh, powerful uh, source of invention, a powerful uh, source of creation. And therefore brings you know, to question official narratives, to rejuvenate culture, to discover new lands, so to speak. On the other hand, doubt can turn into a condition of melancholy, of sadness, of desperation. So we must find a balance between the, uh, the sort of exhilarating feeling of being able to challenge narratives of you know, asking questions, raising doubts, but also we must overcome this moment and we must stop doubt at some point. Otherwise we fall into, the, uh, into melancholy, into the, this sort of being unable to believe into anything and finding ourselves living in a sort of desert of reason. And again, I'm not gonna read the whole text. I'm just reading the final closing lines. Um, in which uh, Barbara writes, so it was wisely decided by the college, and the college means the college of the gods, that it, it being doubt, be shapeless without a figure, without feet, without hands, without a face. That means that doubt is this sort of creepy, shapeless monster without a recognizable features. And if we put together uh, Michelangelo and Barbados text, we see that in the mid 16th century, probably Italians began to feel doubt as a sort of uncanny disquieting presence in the mental landscape, while also recognizing its positive uh, functions. So why am I studying doubt? Why doubt becomes important in the Renaissance? And I guess that there are maybe many, many reasons, many answers to this, uh, many answers to this question. But one of the uh, main reasons is that the world is really rapidly uh, changing. The uh, travels of exploration make Europeans acquainted with new lands, new people, new cultures, new faiths. Uh, the political order in Italy is collapsing. Wars uh, are just shaking Europe, Italy in particular, for decades and what follows war, uh, plague, uh, famine, economic stagnation. What we call the Reformation is breaking the unity of Christendom, the unity of Christian world, and within the, what we call the Reformed world, the different confessions are uh, suggesting different ways to uh, reach the final destination that is uh, salvation. So, and also we should keep in mind that the printing press is spreading news, is spreading books, new technologies are make, making available an incredible amount of information at an incredible speed. And people begin to get news, to receive news about unknown lands, faraway lands, and begin to discuss this news. And soon enough, people begin to realize that these news are not always reliable. This news can be manipulated, so to speak. And they ask themselves, well, what is, can we rely this news? What is really true in these things we hear from far away lands or not so far away lands, but still. And this certainly created a condition of uncertainty, of anxiety, of doubt in early modern Italians and early modern Europeans at large. And I come to my conclusion, so we can discuss later, why is it important to study doubt now in the 21st century? And I guess that if we compare our own current situation, the state we are in, 
we can probably find some similarities with early 16th century world. We are experiencing in an unprecedented way issues of uh, religious divide, issues of religious coexistence, of racial injustice, of clash of cultures. We are experiencing again, an overflow of information that new technologies are making available at an incredible speed. We can't simply handle this amount of information. We are in a condition of doubt. We experience every day the political use of doubt, the spread of uh, contaminated and manipulated information. And doubt is used to discredit political opponents to voice uh, opinions that do not have any, any, any uh, existence or cannot be accepted, but still we must recognize as, recognize as opinion. We must in some ways take into account. Uh, and therefore, I guess that uh, working and trying to understand what the intellectual and emotional responses to that, one, a part of my work is also based on the emotions of doubt on how, what were the emotions uh, connected to doubt. Uh, so if we try to understand what the emotional responses and intellectual responses to doubt were in the 16th century, in the period we call the Renaissance, we may be in a position of better understanding and better handling our own intellectual and emotional responses to this world we are living in today. Thank you. Really fascinating. Thank you very much, Marco. I guess um, we will go back to some of the things you alluded to, and particularly uh, to the relevance. Oh, sorry, I should. Sorry for not unmuting myself. Um, thank you very much, Marco, for your for your presentation. It's particularly exciting to uh, listen to you when you place it in the context of uh, today's world and drawing this comparison. But we'll get back to that uh, in the discussion. I think we can. Um, oh, I was I was unmuted. I hope. Um, we'll get back to all this when we speak with uh, Matteo. Matteo, now you are in a very different position because you have made this amazing piece and you were not aware of Marco's work when you were doing the piece and it so happens that you met around the same theme but your approach is very different. Can you tell us now about Il Dubio, your VR piece? Certainly, thank you, Michel. Um, I'm waiting to be able to share my screen so that I can um, so that I can share my presentation. Michelle, you're 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 muted. Can you hear me? Matteo, you're still mute. We cannot hear you. You cannot hear me. No, Wait. still not. I can see the levels of my microphone going on the, on the call. You cannot hear me. Can you try and remove the headsets? How is now? And disconnect them. Yeah. Can you hear me now? No, we still cannot no. hear you. This is strange. Okay, we can hear you now. You can? Great. You can hear me? Okay, okay. So I'm just waiting to be able to share my presentation. I need the host to give me the access to sharing. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay, well you can go ahead, you, you're co-hosting now. Okay, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Now we can, now we can, thank you. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, Michelle and Marco. Um, I, I found Marco's presentation uh, really interesting. And I think I wanted to start from, you know, a bit like tying in uh, what, what Marco has been saying uh, with what we have been working as uh, me as a VR director and our team are on Il Dubbio. Um, so what is doubt is one of the question uh, that Marco has been asking in his research. And this is exactly the question that we, has, have, that we have been asking in our piece. And similarly to what Marco's research has uncovered, uh, doubt is many different things and, and, and it has been seen by, in different times and by different people and that it has been experiences, experienced in different ways. And so in Il Dubbio, we wanted to show um, all the different sides of doubts um, in a VR experience through um, entering the story through uh, Leonardo da Vinci's moment of doubt and then seeing different types of doubts that artists go through, through three, to three contemporary artists, which will become our main characters. In Il Dubio episode one, that is um, now showing at the 77th most international of Venice, uh, we are entering the studio of Leonardo and we are then visiting the studio of uh, the world, the, the world of doubt of a contemporary artist. So, um, so how did this project start? This, the project started as uh, an idea, as uh, you know, this, this will to, to want to understand uh, my own feeling as you know, a creator of doubting myself, of um, you know, co questioning, constantly questioning the value of what I'm doing or every decision that I'm making is a constant questioning. So I thought that it could be interesting to create um, a VR experience that could actually make the user um, understand doubt in different ways because doubt is a universal feeling and it's something that is not very talked about and is not very accepted in our society. It is on some way, in some ways used, as Marco said, politically to make us um, to make us do certain things through social media in many different ways, but it is not very accepted as a, an existential, as an existential uh, condition. So uh, what is celebrated today is certainty, is strength. And so by celebrating or going in deep into doubt and understanding what doubt is really about, um, you, we hope to dem demystify this universal feeling. Um, so we start this experience uh, in Leonardo's Rome studio. This is um, 1515. Leonardo is uh, in his 60s and he's coming to the end of his career. He will stay in Rome three years or four years and then move to France when he, was, he will die after three years. So at this moment of his career, Leonardo is, um, Leonardo da Vinci is is seeing all the result of kind of the failures of his life. He, since the beginning, Leonardo's curiosity had led him to never really, um, never really stick with one project. Once he would have learned, what, what, once he would have learned from an experience, he would then decide, okay, I'm finished with this piece, I've learned enough, next. And so what would happen was that like the series of works that would never be completed was massive. And his uh, commissioner, the people that actually gave him money to do work, weren't very happy. And so by the age of 60, you can imagine that Leonardo was uh, not very loved and by his commissioners and by the people that held positions of powers in Rome where he was uh, at the Pope's court. And so we imagined this moment, it's, it's, a, it's an historical recreation, but it's also, you know, an, at the same time, it's, it's an imaginary world. We, we, we do not know how uh, Leonardo was doubting himself. We know that he arrived at a certain point in his career where the failures were massive and where uh, he spent four years in Rome and there's no documentation of these four years. While big artists like Michelangelo were building and were, you know, were getting massive commissions, Leonardo was, 
virtually invisible. And so we imagine Leonardo in this moment, in this small studio, um, at the end of his life, uh, at the end of his career, looking back, looking back at his, um, at his career and looking back in a, in a very negative way, doubting that everything he has done really uh, was worthless. Um, so we built a studio, this CGI recreation of the studio. And the idea was for the user to come in and never see Leonardo, but listen to his thoughts and know that he's very close. He's in the room next door. So feel his presence and be somehow in his mind, in the space of his mind. And we create, uh, so the user hears, so the user enters in the studio and is able to interact with the story by lighting candles. So the user can grab a lamp and by lighting candles, he will be able to unlock different parts of the story and different parts of the doubts. And there's three, there's three main um, phases in the studio that are um, dictated by three objects. One is, um, well, you can see here, the master of unfinished works. These, are, these are the faces. You have distracted yourself and accomplished nothing. So as you can see in the video, uh, we are using uh, these particle faces as if they are the ghosts of the past, the failures that appear and, um, and you know, appear and speak the doubts that Leonardo is feeling within himself, is hearing within himself. So in this world, we see three artworks and these three artworks all, all uh, symbolize a different unfinished or a different struggle that then provokes the artist to doubt, doubt themselves. So in the Sant'Anna with the Vergine, e Bambino and San Giovanni, which was a cartoon, was a piece of paper that had like, that had the, suscitated wonder for its three-dimensionality, for the beauty of, of uh, you know, the, the pen and, the, the, and how, how realistically uh, the clothes were rendered. But uh, as there was a massive expectation of like this cartoon to become an actual painting, the painting never happened. Uh, Saint John is also an artwork that Leonardo took 10 years to finish. And so um, in the studio, we will see the incomplete uh, painting and um, and also this 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 struggle at you know not really like taking years and years to finish um, is something that you know at this point of his life comes back and haunts him but the biggest failure and the biggest uh, source of doubts um, for Leonardo is uh, the horse that he was supposed to build uh, for the for the Duke of Milan at the beginning of his career um, this was a massive, the biggest horse that was ever supposed to, the biggest bronze horse ever made. It would have been like a massive um, complex, bronze complex that was going to be positioned in the center of Milan, close to the castle. And this, um, you know, this massive undertaking was too ambitious and Leonardo was never able to finish it. And Milan's um, gazettes had published with large anticipation, this sculpture would have given the city, um, uh, you know, an incredible uh, fame. But this never happened, and the upset, disappointment were massive. So all of these stories, all of these uh, memories, crowd the mind of Leonardo at this stage of his career. And uh, the user is literally in the middle of this meltdown, in the middle of this. Uh, of the breakdown of this artist. Um, what was a very important aspect was for us, for me as a director and for the creative director, Rafael Pavon, who helped us with, um, with the you know, design uh, of what the user is doing, was to make the user uh, active in the story, but not to make these interactions too complicated and uh, to present. So these interactions, uh, the, candle, the candle seemed like a very easy thing to do, a very intuitive thing to do, and, and gave the power to the user to reveal the story around them. And so this gives the user this feeling of being active in the space, of having something to do there. 
um, you know, when you're in a VR world, you want to, uh, you're, 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 we are simulating reality somehow, even if it's not reality. We are, as, as, as director, we need to kind of uh, create a fictitious uh, illusions uh, that feel real, which is a bit of a paradox, but is, that feels what, what, what we're supposed to do in VR. Um, here is another little Stop snippet. The truth, the truth. I know From, the human body better than God. And what do we do? Disorder. So yeah, this is another snippet from from the from the from VR from from Leonardo's VR world, and um, so we wanted to, one of the most important thing of this project is that we wanted to bring uh, this concept of doubt not only not only as it as of it as something uh, relevant to the past, but bring it to contemporary life, and also have this idea of. Um, the timeless relationship that artists have with doubt, which was a relationship that existed in the Renaissance and that exists now. And with Leonardo, we see a very um, kind of monstrous uh, type of doubt appearing, um, similar to the one that um, Marco was talking about before. But we wanted also to you know, decline doubt in all its different uh, phases and uh, all these different faces, actually. And so, um, and so Velasco Vitali, so we, we decided to find uh, contemporary artists that could bring this experience, the different faces of, of different faces of doubt. And the first artist that we are featuring in this um, project is Velasco Vitali, a Milanese artist that focuses on, um, focuses on the relationship with memory and cities and He's a Milanese artist, and one of his most famous artworks is um, 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 this complex, sculptural complex of dogs. It's called Sbarco. It's a, Sbarco is a, is, a, is a sculptural complex that talks about um, individuality, crowd, um, relationship between humans and cities, but all of this mediated to the metaphor of these packs of dogs that somehow symbolize humans and how they relate to each other. Um, we chose Velasco because his relationship to doubt was particularly interesting. For him, as soon as, the first time that I wrote to him, I said, look, I'm doing this project about doubt and it's a VR project and we're trying to make the user understand doubt in a different way and see how artists are experiencing this. Um, he was so immediately uh, excited because his work had revolved around the relationship, um, his relationship with doubt. Um, and this relationship is a constructive relationship. So he, he knows that doubt is a part of the process and he needs doubt to create. And he goes all the way to say that doubt is the beginning of an artwork. Without a doubt, there is no art. And so we found that, you know, just opposing these two moments, one of Leonardo and one of these contemporary artists, both uh, living with doubt, but seeing it in completely different ways, um, could have been an interesting uh, approach. Um, also with Velasco, the, uh, the, in the process when the unpredictability the, of the, the aesthetic is quite sure different. of myself. But I fear that if I doubt I work too much, I might lose faith. And what do you think? I... So the, the, the aesthetic changes quite a bit. We are going into an interact, we are going into um, a world that is a contemporary, and so we needed to find a, a way to uh, make the experience work, but at the same to make it clear that we are coming to today, to, to, the, to the current times. Um, yes, so um, what's next? We are working on, um, with other two contemporary artists. Um, one is Bernard Schmild, um, who is a Dutch artist who um, will be part of this experience. And then another uh, contemporary artist, which we are now talking to. Um, and, 
we are finalizing, so I will not say her name. Um, and the experience will end again in Leonardo's studio, where Leonardo will have overcome his moment of doubt. Um, it's in the process when. So yes, so thank you so much for listening. I hope you can go and see the experience. Um, and it's only until Saturday, but it will be available soon on um, Vive ports and hopefully in the next few months on Oculus. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Matteo. Um, the parallel is indeed very interesting between what you both said, Marco and, uh, and Matteo. I wanted to ask you, Marco, right away, something when you said how, when you were talking about how relevant your research is to today's, um, to today's times, you alluded to the religious divide that instigates doubt. You also alluded, of course, to the overflow of information uh, that we cannot handle, but also of course the manipulated information, fake news, etc. I was thinking as I was listening that there's also a, an even um, another fundamental uh, value that can create doubt for all of us. It's the, the fact that we everything changes all the time. And the notion of change in our um, society is, um, is something that we, that we have a hard time to deal with because it's as if we will never go back to, there's an echo, I think you should, I, so, yeah, and we, we have to turn, we are, just so you know, we are, uh, Marco and I, we are in the same room in Venice at the Hotel Excelsior, and if we don't turn off our, our mics, it creates this echo loop, sorry. Uh, yes, yeah, so I wanted to know your opinion on this notion of change. Uh, there, there was a time when, when people could, could plan their lives, they could, they could um, uh, think of stability, stability in their emotional life, in their work life, it was something that was the pattern and change was just a transition between two different phases of stability. It's no longer the case. Is this something you, you um, have been um, thinking about in your research? Thank you, Michelle, and apologies for my clumsiness. I just got to mute my, my laptop. But uh, no, that's a very good question. And um, change is certainly a, a, a crucial aspect. Uh, it is for us, and change is also crucial in the, uh, in, in the past. And I find that those people in the Renaissance were particularly exposed to change in, a several, in several ways. Uh, just uh, think of what, uh, uh, you know, sudden political changes could mean to people, uh, uh, wars uh, coming, changes of allegiances between uh, different powers. These people were really uh, found themselves in a world that was really rapidly changing. They were weak. They were, in a way, unable to make sense of, um, of, uh, of a complex reality, the reality they were experiencing with economic changes and political and religious changes you know it was something that was really new and probably shocking to them I mean, they lived in a world that was seeing things unseen before and the sense of a the, of an end of the world approaching which is something that certainly returns in time and uh, but certainly was strong at the at the time so the sense that we are approaching something unknown that we cannot chart and cannot foresee that is, that was also uh, a feeling uh, that was very, very, very strong. I've, I've seen, um, I've seen studies by neuroscientists who, who talk about the human brain as uh, functioning like a, a, a sort of a Google search engine where every time you're confronted with something new, you, uh, you try to refer, oops, still an echo. It's not. Yes. Um, every time we, we are confronted with something new, we try to find references in the database of our, of our memories, of our education, to try and, and see what it looks like. 
Um, and I think it's very destabilizing for the for humans. And it was a time from what you say in the Renaissance, and it is today, to to not find references to what we're experiencing today. And this notion of change is um, is can be very um, disturbing. I, I, I agree, yes, that was a time of unprecedented events. And also one thing I didn't mention in my talk and is in a way related to this, that for uh, early modern people, medieval people as well before, but particularly for those people, what we call a reality, which is something we can more or less relate, you know, it's something we know, we, we, we more or less know is something stable object outside, you know, that we, the world is, however complicated is something we can more or less understand. To those people was a mystery, was really enigmatic. Um, we are talking about virtual worlds today. And to those people, in effect, virtual reality, sort of virtual reality was everyday experience. We no longer are accustomed to miracles, to visions, to prodigies, to uh, extraordinary events taking place taking place in the, in the outside world and really challenging the boundaries between what we see and what we, what we see as real and what we see as imagination between illusion, if you like, and, and a reality between dreams and wake as someone put it, you know? So this sense of unexpected of having events that take place in the real world, but is, is it a, really real, that world, you know? Uh, you, you know, it, it was really, a world of mesmerizing vision and events. And these people sometimes, if you, if you read um, the sources, were really scared and, and unable to make sense of the world and what was taking place. And certainly there was a combination of outside events, like for example, discoveries, what we call um, discoveries and the sense of mysterious events taking place as a consequence, you know, or as a sort of announce of something that will come in the future. And these people really found themselves destabilized and, didn't know, you know, where to look at to find. Sometimes this is at least the sense I get from my from my sources. I find your I find your proper your proposition very interesting to equate um, uh, the concept of virtual reality with that of the mystery. Uh, of religion with miracles in particular and supernatural facts that were explained through religion. Matteo, the, the, it's interesting that uh, the concept you have been using to create interactivity in your piece is the candle um, that you use to establish a connection and a presence with the, the viewer. But as we saw from Marco's uh, examples, this image of a, of a candle or a lantern is uh, seem, uh, illuminating the path ahead it seems to be a, a, a recurring image of uh, the way Renaissance depicted doubt. Uh, did you know about this or did you make this connection intentionally or was, was it just a coincidence? I think it was a coincidence, um, but we definitely spoke about it at one point, but it was, it was I think, it was in a similar time that we started talking that we also were developing this idea of the candle, um, of the lantern. Um, and yeah, the idea was, I mean, at the beginning, I think I saw it in some other, I saw fire in another VR experience. So I was like, okay, this seems like something that could work. And I didn't even know why even. But then um, I started thinking, ah, you know, like we are in this darkness and this darkness symbolizes what is unknown uh, or what is doubted, what, you know, that this darkness is somehow, can, can be related to doubt. And so light seems like something that we need in order to, to find some, some certainty or something or to follow the story. So the candle and the, and the deep darkness around you, uh, I think complemented uh, the, con the concepts that uh, we wanted to convey. It sounds like, creatively speaking, you went along the same path conceptually to come up with this idea of the light as, uh, as artists did uh, five centuries ago <laughs> before you. So I think it's, it's yes. quite a, an interesting coincidence. 
Um, your, your project is, is really grounded in, in historical reality, but of course you interpreted it uh, to uh, design your, your, your project. How did you go about researching uh, the life and time of Leonardo and what part of that did you have to reinterpret and redesign for uh, visualizing the history of Leonardo? Can you hear me now? Ah, okay. Yes, we can uh, hear you. Yes, we can hear you. So, um, the can you repeat one second the last part? I couldn't. I couldn't hear you. I, I wanted to know how much um, research you did on uh, yes. the historic reality and what kind of, how did you expand from there to interpret visually uh, Leonardo's studio and time? So we knew that from historical records that Leonardo was in Rome for four years um, or five years um, at, by the, just before he went to France. And I read a few biographies and there was always this hole of like, what, is, what, what was Leonardo doing in Rome in these years? And there was nothing. He was commissioned with some, you know, like really artisanal works with some mirrors, some an, an, uh, arm, armatura, how do you say? Um, some cast of like metal for battle, an armor, yeah. And that was it. So. There was this, and then there were some letters of him in which he was basically, you know, really frustrated with, with, with an assistant that didn't respect him, that they didn't even like, you know, had zero respect for him, stole his stuff. It was, it was quite of a grim picture. And he, and we also had through an historian, uh, Antonio Forcellino, the size of the studio of Leonardo that he had found from, from Rome, from the Vatican archives, where the Vatican, the Pope had hired some workers to make Leonardo's quarters, you know, with furniture. And, and so you had the whole sizes of, of the studio. And so also the size of the studio and the area where the studio was kind of gave you this picture of not a very nice neighborhood, um, not very nice things, uh, and a very small space. And so from these facts, we could imagine the state, the mental state of this man that had lived in grandeur and he was famous all over Italy and the world of that time. And so we can imagine him arriving at 60 or 62, 63 years old. And he's like in a tiny room, like uh, with not very nice furniture and a few of his artworks and nobody wants to commission him work. And from there, we start to imagine what can this man be going through? and. Yeah, so the research really grounded us into that imagining, but the imagination then became really grounded into the facts. Um, Marco, at some point in your presentation, you spoke about uh, this concept of strategies of doubt. Can you can you just expand a little bit? What particular strategies do you mean? Yeah, um, I was. What I had in mind was um, particularly certain religious contexts in which uh, doubt becomes uh, either a way to uh, protect protect yourself or to defend yourself against the the inquisitorial eye, particularly in the time when the Inquisition began begins to put a lot of pressure uh, onto what we uh, now call the reform world in Italy. And, and therefore, you know, for example, that becomes a, a rhetorical strategy. You could say prohibited things and things you're not supposed to say in a way of putting them as a doubt, for example. Or you can use doubt as a means to proselytize. And there are some amazing uh, inquisitorial process and trials in which people said they were 
induced by other people to doubt about fundamental ideas of, of religious uh, Catholic orthodoxy. And then that was used you know, to dismantle one by one, little by little, all certainties. And these people began a journey, an intellectual journey that led them, led, led them sometimes to conversion to uh, Lutheran ideas, and then they moved because once you, you, you set doubt in motion, you simply can't stop. So these people began doubting uh, certain Catholic ideas and they moved to extreme, even uh, almost more and more extreme ideas. And they ended up sort of believing in nothing and severing all the ties, the social ties, even family ties they had because simply they cannot share a common ground with anyone. So, you know, uh, that could be used either to protect yourself, to attract new people to your confession to proselytize you know that, 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 that's why i'm talking uh, about strategies of doubt you can use it doubt as a as a tool to obtain certain goals you know to to uh, to your purposes and these purposes can vary depending on the on the context uh mark mark marco i'm i'm, I'm interested, interested you need to to mute um I'm interested in knowing is if in your research over doubt, you are also talking or working with psychologists or psychoanalysts. So I, I'm asking this because when you say this, like say setting emotion, you know, the, the, the doubt strategy as a tool or as a process, it's true that when you start this, there's no certainty anymore, yet you still need to make decisions in one's life at some point, you need to choose. And when you're constantly doubting, choosing becomes a, a process, it can become a loop within which the creator, the artist, but also the common man um, uh, starts being trapped and unable to, to act. Is that more um, a psychological aspect part of your uh, research as well? Um, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, this is this is a, a great question, actually. Yes, I'm, um, one of the aspects I'm working on is, is uh, uh, emotions and uh, certainly this psychological condition. And um, very often people ask me when I said I work on that, they ask me, so you're working on skepticism? And I say, no, I'm not working on skepticism. Skepticism is just about intellectual uh, ideas. What I'm working on is a very fluid notion that situates itself at the intersection between, let's say, the the, the bodily uh, and the psychological and intellectual dimension and doubt was actually con considered in many sources as a disease, a disease of the soul, but also a disease of the body that could be cured and you could actually do things to, you know, um, but this is a point um, to, to, to overcome the, your, your condition of doubt. But this is a point when our contemporary perception of doubt and Renaissance ideas on that tend to diverge um, because we tend to label every condition of uncertainty as doubt. In fact, early modern people add different words for different conditions of doubt. So that was really a radical impossibility to make a decision. You know, you, you have two options and you can simply just decide. So you should refrain from acting. But there are other conditions which were called scruple, for example, which is a lighter condition of doubt, if you like, but was considered as a, as a disease. And actually, theologians spoke of it uh, as a disease, a disease that um, was also gendered. It was mostly women that were prone to fall into this kind of scruple. But also, you know, uh, people of little education and, uh, but, but so, you know, men and educated people, this, this, this impossibility of, you know, setting limits to your doubts. And, and, and it, it was a real disease that must, that needed to be addressed in also and being cured. And it was certainly based on what they call melancholy oftentimes. And melancholy was a condition, a psychological condition. So yes, um, psychology was really uh, important back then and is important in my, in my work. Matteo, your, your, your entire VR piece is centered around an emotional experience that uh, Leonardo is, 
experiencing, but also your um, uh, first artist, you know, for this first episode, Velasco Vitali. Uh, but what emotions did you want to evoke in order to get your message about doubt across? You, you didn't want to inspire despair. You wanted to convey the idea that uh, there was something positive around doubt. So is, is that what you were going after, um, emotionally speaking? Yeah, I think the the idea was is to show the show an, a narrative arc within the feeling of doubt because doubting um, is really you know it has a story inside. You're going through many different feelings, and doubt is some kind of um, like the, the the square or the, what holds these, feeling, these feelings together. So in, in Leonardo's studio, there is, you know, the moment of kind of self-pity. There is a moment of, um, of hope uh, then that is immediately shut down. Then there is a moment of frustration, anger, and desperation. And then something picks, picks him up, picks Leonardo up, some, some thoughts, something, uh, you know, doesn't close the, the scene in complete darkness, even if it's quite dark. But the idea is that now in this episode one with Leonardo, we are really like experiencing the darkest side of this moment. And when we will have the full piece, we will go, we will come back to him as he has elaborated this moment and used it in some way. But then uh, the artists that we, 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 we are featuring, they are the container of the story and they, um, they somehow represent what we can't see of Leonardo because we don't, we, we can't know what Leonardo really went through. But we will see how these artists experience doubts. And so, you know, in, in Velasco, there is a real positive attitude towards it. There is really like understanding that uh, doubt is the only way to, to shape ideas. It's the only way to choose uh, things. You need to doubt that something is is right for for whatever you're making you you need to, you're in a constant you're in a constant uh, state of um of you know is this right is this not right of questioning yourself um and then uh and then through the other artists we will experience very specific and and unique ways of of understanding the feeling and of experiencing it and then by the end we will go back into Leonardo's world and see how he's in, internalized this moment and how he has overcome the moment. Matteo, for you as an artist, uh, are you, uh, your motivation to explore doubt through Leonardo and through these three um, contemporary artists, is this a, a journey for yourself to try and find answers with your own uh, way of uh, processing doubt for yourself. And by doing this, are you offering me as a viewer um, a reflection on how I could transcend my own doubts in, in, in life? Can you hear me now? Yeah. So, uh, yes, I think that I am very doubtful as a person and I have always been. <laughs> So that's what I guess that the idea of uh, the idea of uh, making this piece came from that, um, and it was quite easy for me to write the, the dialogues <laughs> because I were precisely like literally like listening to yourself and just writing it down, um, and yeah. Uh, what, what what was the second part of your question? All right, you're mute. It, the second part was whether it was your intention to try and help the viewers of your piece to uh, understand that doubt is not all negative and that you can you can embrace it in a way and move forward in life, accepting that you can be doubtful about things. Um, I think that also what, what um, I think this also stemmed by seeing that the people that are, that are 
viewed as heroes or you know people that are yeah heroes or that are, that we look up to in general are certain are strong um, and and I didn't fall into this category um, and so I thought that you know by creating a world where we can but everyone everyone lives their doubts and so I think there is this denial of doubt of doubting as something that is not acceptable somehow in, 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 a cap, in this society, in this very like capitalistic society in which we live in, where you have to produce, you have to be certain, you have to be strong in, cer in certain ways. This can be argued, but... <laughs> um, and so uh, by, by creating this world in which people can, can, see, can, can see that, you know, also major figures or people that, you know, have created something that they, they value, uh, go constantly through this feeling, maybe will, um, will allow the users to, to view their relationship with doubt in a different way and will allow them to, 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 to think that maybe, you know, not being always certain, not, not always looking like you have it all together is, is you know, is that important. Marco, I just want to go back to um, uh, something you, you, you keep alluding to, which is for me fascinating, is the parallel between the Renaissance time and today. When you alluded to the information overload and, the, and how disturbing it was uh, in the Renaissance, even including fake news in those times, um, did, 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 was it a surprise to you to find this? similarity, I would say, between the times of the Renaissance and today, or was this something you knew and that inspired your, your research? Mm, it was, no, um, it, it, it was something I didn't know at the beginning and I, I came across it. It's something that is well known for later periods, let's say the 17th century, when really the spread of, let's say, newspapers becomes really sizable and, and important. And therefore, also the, the spread of false information becomes a really a, a phenomenon that really attracts the, the, the attention of, of people, intellectuals and common people alike. But uh, finding that already in the 1550s, people were, conscious that this was happening. Yes, that certainly struck me as odd and unexpected. And of course, I don't have many references to this uh, uh, phenomenon, but I have a couple of quite interesting. One is also even explicitly saying that, you know, well, if you are a king and your people are going through a different difficult time, well, why not circulating printed letters, spreading in news, you know, saying that everything is, is going okay. And that was really uh, certainly surprising in, in the 1550s, 1540s were very early. And yet, yes, these people were somehow beginning to realize that what you can do with the information if you are skilled and uh, intelligent enough to use it in, to your purposes. Um, yeah, this is this is quite uh, interesting how, how the processes uh, repeat themselves in in you know throughout uh, throughout history, and it's quite moving actually to see how same behaviors behavioral patterns um, functioned you know centuries ago, same as uh, today basically. Uh, Matteo, I wanted to ask, how did you decide on the artists that you wanted to include? On your on your piece, was it based on your knowledge of the fact that they were aware of how much doubt was an important part of their creative process? Yes, um, it was always. In the end, we wanted to have some artists that had something to say about doubt and for for whom doubt was very important part of their practice. And I must say that a lot of artists have relationship with doubts. Everyone is gonna say something. But when Velasco told me that for him, the artwork begins with a doubt, then I felt that um, he was one of the good characters. 
Um, the second artist is uh, Bernot. He works more with doubt in terms of uh, doubting reality or questioning the fabric of reality. Uh, and so that was a very different, you know, from going from something existential, we go to something that is more, uh, yeah, it's basically, it's, it, it's more outside. It's not outside of yourself, but it's more, you know, literally um, semi-optics and doubting like light and creating illusions. And so, so his, his work, in his work, he creates clouds um, that, that last for a very short time. And so in, in the VR experience, we are now working on creating a CGI, CGI cloud that um, the user would be able to interact with. And then we are, we are, we are, we are searching, we, are, we have a few options for the third artist and we are talking about a few um, uh, actually Kenyan uh, female artists. And um, we are excited on what kind of doubts we, we can find also here, down here in Nairobi, where I'm, where I'm based. So you're going to be working on the next episode with um, Bernold Schmidt yeah. and then later. And so when each episode will be done, it will be a full piece, right? It yes. Will be like a three part uh, yeah. piece, but you will keep making reference to Leonardo da Vinci in parallel with the two other artists or are you done with no, no, uh, yes. Leonardo? So the piece will, will basically, in, so the piece will begin and end with Leonardo and then in between each artist, in, in between each artist, the transition that takes us to the next world will be something that reminds us of, of Leonardo. So it's okay. going to be an artwork, something, but something very subtle, an animation that will take us back uh, mm. to the beginning. And then by the end, it, it would be as if Leonardo had learned from all that the user had seen. And also he would have been changed, would have changed through this, through this experience. Marco, um, where do you stand today with your study? What are the, what are the, the threads that you that you are following. What are the um, where do you see yourself going right now with the study? That's a, that's a tricky question. <laughs> that's that's the most difficult one. Well, uh, mm, so what I'm doing? Uh, well, let, let, let me start saying what I'm doing. Uh, of that, I have a, a, an idea, uh, more or less. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm writing, a, I'm writing a book uh, that should be out in a in a year or, or two, maybe, and which explores, like I said, doubt and Renaissance Italy, with a special focus on like common people, and this is what I would like to do. And from there, I would like to explore and to move to the study of. Uh, you know, popular mistakes, what were called at the time popular mistakes. We like to understand more how a whole world of ideas, of beliefs, you know, has, has, has turned into and why it's been turned into a series of, of mistakes. I would like to, to recapture the voices of those, those people, you know, and very often uh, doubt was also a way, you know, to, to, to contest, to to, 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 to question the, the, the stand of truth and to make space for other ideas and other ways. And I would like to move in this, in this uh, direction, uh, how these people found in doubt a way to, let's say, assert their identity, you know, and to find their own place in, in, in the world. And uh, I would like to recapture that, that, that whole world of ideas and cultures that tend to be in a way lost in a sort of, uh, Records of of history. Um, I would like to ask you something that is closer to all of us now. But in these times of um, of uh, pandemic, uh, doubt is in everyone's mind. I mean, we we know so so little about the virus itself, about the potential. Uh, treatments, how the world is going to be now, you know, in the post pandemic, it's, uh, it's on everyone's mind and it's impacting everyone's life at the moment. It translates, I mean, this, this uncertainty, 
uh, and doubt about the future actually translates uh, into fear for, for most people. That is yet again a parallel with the Renaissance times. But I was interested in you in, in um, asking how your, I was going to say knowledge of doubt and your research around doubt, has it, how has it impacted your own reaction and your own behavior in the front of the pandemic, Marco, and then Matteo? Matteo, would you like to start? Uh, that's, uh, that, that, that's also a very beautiful, beautiful um, question. Um, I don't know if I have an answer actually to this to this question. Uh, certainly, I, I found myself like every one of us uh, in 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 a position of yeah, in a, in a way being not only unable to find answers to my questions, but also to be in a way physically uh, projected back in time. I was I was I was closed in a room like all of us were. I was I was in a in another country. I was uh, it was impossible to travel. I was completely uh, uh, far away and severed from my uh, family and, and 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 from my partner, from uh, everyone of, uh, from everyone I, I knew. I don't know if this had an impact on the let's say intellectual level, certainly on the emotional level, it did, it did. I found myself like suddenly, uh, like I guess we all did, you know, suddenly lacking all uh, reassurance, you know, I was, I was left alone. I didn't know, didn't have answers. And I was, I had this idea of being in a world that I didn't, know, didn't understand, could not predict and uh, could not rely on people. Simple everyday actions have become I don't know, really complicated. Um, certainly, yes, I, I could probably relate to people who hundreds of years ago lived in similar experiences. Like I said, I didn't probably uh, turn this into an intellectual, serious, you know, I don't know, intellectual or responses, but certainly uh, emotionally, yes, I could relate to that sense of uncertainty easily and yeah. Matteo, what, what is your own experience as you are researching doubts in your own way through the piece? Has it helped you in reacting to the pandemic? You're, you're mute, you're still mute. No, you're still mute. You're still mute. Uh, learn, uh, Matteo. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, we we would have never like we were supposed to the to deliver the piece in April, um, if it wasn't for the pandemic and show it at a museum in Milan, and we would have I think that now looking back we would have never been able to do that like in time, so it would have been a disaster. So. Um, I just think that maybe the pandemic on that side kind of helped us. I mean, it's horrible to say, but, um, and then, you know, I don't know, honestly, like for me, I, I, I live in Kenya. So yes, the pandemic was here and Nairobi where I live was, was completely isolated and blocked from the rest of the country for three months. And we had a curfew and we still have a curfew now, by the way. Um, but in the end, it wasn't as bad as, as, as in Europe. And um, I think it gave us, for me, it gave me this time to, to be able to, to just focus on what I was doing and to not be, feel like I was always supposed to be somewhere else or I'm supposed to be here or there around the world or like go and visit this and that person. I was just in one place and that gave me the space to, to focus on, on the project. The project was happening online, everyone was remote. Um, I think that one side of this pandemic is that it made us stay in a place. And I think that that made me a lot reflect on all the things that were not necessary that I, that I was doing before. So I, I see at the end of these months, I honestly see, I want to focus on what I've learned. And I think that what I've learned was quite positive. I don't know if that had anything to do with doubt, but. 
Well, I think it. I think it does because it it forces you to reconsider, you know, the the criteria, the the priorities on which you base your life, and it it upset everything. But let me ask you then: What is your biggest personal doubt for the future now, and also for you for your work? How do, how do you, how do you stand now with this value? of doubt, whether positive or, ne or negative, for your own future? Um, I don't think it's, I think that it's not something that you can avoid, but I think that I'm learning that uh, it's, the, it's part of the process. Um, and I think that the best way is to embrace it and make it part of your process. And then, and without embracing it, Without doubting, you won't be able to create something that is meaningful. Marco, what would be your response to the same question? What, how do you see uh, your biggest personal doubt for the future for, and for your work? Um, okay. Um. I guess that my perhaps my biggest doubt at the moment is like many other researchers is that I'm living in a sort of condition of, uh, um, in an unstable condition. And for my, 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 my really pressing doubt is what I'm gonna to do next year uh, when my fellowship ends. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm, that, is, that, that is a condition that you know, is common to quite many research that's at the, at, in this moment. But like Matteo said, I, I'm embracing my doubt. I'm trying to find the positive side of this condition of, you know, uncertainty. It like pushes me to come up with ideas. It forces me to uh, pushes my boundaries a little bit further, you know, to, to challenge myself to, well, let's see what I can do. Let's see if I can come up with something brilliant that appeals to some to people, you know, and uh, so, you know, it's a really ambiguous situation and condition that really, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do probably in the next 10 months or something. At the same time, I'm in a way strangely happy about it because, you know, that gives me opportunities. So, yeah. I think we're, we're about to wrap this, this uh, conversation. Um, I, which I find extremely enlightening, but uh, you need to mute yourself. <laughs> Thank you. The, it, it, it's very enlightening because you have been um, throwing bridges both between the past and the present, but also uh, through your work, Marco and Matteo, you know, throwing uh, light on this concept that artists working today as they were in the past are able to uh, embrace doubt as a creative uh, dynamic. And I find that any one of us listening can uh, learn from this and apply the lessons that you have taught us in our own uh, private lives every day. Um, before you wrap, is there anything, Marco, that you would like to add or anyone you want to mention? Um, before we wrap. Um, no, well, I would like to, um, to thank uh, everybody uh, who made this event possible. Yeah, that, thank you, thanks uh, people at Science Gallery Venice. I would like to thank my uh, supervisor, Marcus Garbis at Kafoskari University. He's a friend and, uh, you know, he, he was the first suggesting me to apply for this fellowship and in a way gave me the possibility to you know to to, to do it and uh, and i want i would like to thank matteo we had a really nice uh, some nice exchange of ideas uh, over time i will we'll meet again we'll discuss again and that's uh, that's it matteo about what about you Yes, I wanted to thank uh, Marco, which we had some great conversation, Neil from Science Gallery, everyone on Ars Electronica and Science Gallery, and then our sponsors at Vive Arts and Viveport, who made Il Dubbio possible.
Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, I wanted to say on a personal note that I'm the uh, curator for uh, Venice VR Expanded, the, uh, ve the VR competition of the International Festival in Venice. And it's, uh, this, this notion of doubt is at the heart of uh, the work of curating because you're selecting works and of course you could select others and you'd never have any kind of certainty that you have made your the right choices, but I'm very happy and proud that Il Dubio, Matteo's piece, can be part of our uh, selection uh, this year. I would uh, like to mention that I am also on the advisory board for the Science Gallery here in Venice, working with Neil Hartman and all his team, the building that they're going to be um, producing a restoration of a historical building in Venice is a very exciting project that will be unfolding in the next uh, year or year and a half or so. And we're all looking very much forward here in Venice to the opening of this uh, brilliant uh, initiative. And um, I would like to end by uh, thanking Neil, his team at the science, at the science, <coughs> excuse me, uh, gallery, the whole network, the whole concept of the Science Gallery Network is a very powerful one and extremely original. And uh, of course, thanking Kafoscari uh, as the um, partner for, for this and for this event, the European Commission, Reframe VR, Overlat, and Ars Electronica. It's been a pleasure to discuss uh, this afternoon uh, this topic with you, Marco, and with you, Matteo, and I hope we will meet again. And thank you for all of you who have been watching. Goodbye.